I'm uh, wanting to talk about a project that we've been working on at Newcastle University in the ROC team there, although uh, as you can see from this list of icons on the first page, we've got a, a number of different collaborators we're working with for this, um, and it's an ongoing project. Um, so yeah, it would be great to, uh, as well as any questions you might have, if anyone's got any recommendations for ideas for how we can be um, improving the way we're doing this, that would be great. So I'm going to talk a bit about what the project is um, and then focus particularly on um, how we've been going about uh, tackling um, the machine learning problem when um, on the cloud, um, because one of the restrictions we have for this project is that we're using um, data which uh, is quite sensitive from the NHS and needs to be carefully controlled um, and we can't just download it and play with it on our laptops. Um, talk about some of the challenges faced and the solutions we've come up with. Um, so to uh, crack on with this, um, the project, uh, the acronym in, in good scientific uh, tradition is ORCA, which has nothing to do with uh, sea mammals. Um, it's about organ quality assessment. And the problem that we're trying to tackle here is that while organ transplantation can save lives, Waiting lists are often very long and decisions about whether an organ is suitable for transplantation have to be made um, in a very high stressed environment um, you know, and there can be a very time critical thing without time for detailed testing. Um, so there, there is an issue um, existing where when sometimes when surgeons are uncertain about organ transplantability um, and are unable to get uh, an opinion from um, experts with more experience specifically in transplantation, um, viable organs can be discarded. So the proposed solution that we're working towards here is to develop a tool that can help aid decision making, um, giving access to an objective expert based assessment of the organ. <clears throat> So to rephrase that slightly, uh, what we're actually aiming to do in this project is to create a tool which will actually allow surgeons to upload a photo of an organ um, and get back uh, an assessment of transplant viability to help inform decision making around this organ transplantation. Um, and this has partly come about because we've got uh, some clinicians at the NHS who are very involved in organ transplantation who said that um, uh, this, is, this is sometimes the way that these things are done is that someone will send a picture and say, do you think this is viable to some to to someone who has expertise in organ transplantation? And if that's done at three a.m., then you're not potentially going to get an answer back, or they may not be in their best state to answer. Um, having an application that will be able to consolidate in some way the knowledge of these experts and help provide that feedback um, could be a really helpful tool for informing this decision making. Um, so, in terms of who's working on this. Uh, the Newcastle University Research Software Engineering team, um, which I'm a member of, um, have a number of people who've been working on this project in app development and machine learning and also setting up the cloud infrastructure, which I'm going to talk about, about today. Um, we've also got some collaborators at Bradford University who are academics rather than RSEs um, with expertise in machine learning. And, um, of course, a number of NHS clinicians who are uh, really invested in this and have been pushing it forward and giving guidance all the way through. So to break it down to requirements, what we're trying to create here, uh, we want a front end application for surgeons that will allow them to access organ quality assessments. And under the hood of that, we're going to want a machine learning algorithm to assess the organ transplant viability. Um, in order to uh, get an accurate machine learning algorithm, we've been developing a front-end application as well to gather training data for this machine learning algorithm, um, which will be in the form of uh, feedback from clinicians who have experience in organ transplantation, evaluating um, existing images of organs as to uh, whether they would go ahead with a transplant. Um, we need a database to store the organ image data and the surgeon scores from the machine learning uh, training data and um, importantly secure storage for the sensitive organ images because um, as you might imagine um, images of human organs is, is not a data set that we want to be passing around willy nilly and in order to get access to this data from the NHS um, we've got a lot of restrictions on um, how we store it and how we use it. So uh, given that this is the AI machine learning stream, um, I'm going to particularly focus on talking about the machine learning aspect of this um, and how we've gone about setting this up, uh, given the restrictions we have on our data. Um, 
So to talk about the data, because obviously that's quite critical when you're training machine learning algorithms, what we currently have um, is pilot image data of 200 plus images, uh, which is quite a small data set to be starting out with. Um, the, the, there have been some initial um, pilot projects where we had some uh, promising results from using this data, which has led to the larger grant that we're working on now. Um, and we've got an arrangement with the NHS Blood and um, Transplant Unit to access a large data bank of um, 50,000 plus images uh, with associated right. metadata. Uh, it would have been nice if I could have come to you today and said, we have that data and we're working on it right now. If any of you have worked with the NHS, you'll know these things take time and are still taking a bit of time. But we uh, have our agreements in place and it's it's now just a, a bit of a waiting game to get the data transferred. Um, so that's, that's what we're hoping to be working with um, and working towards. In terms of the labels for this image data, um, as I've mentioned, uh, this the, the approach we're taking is to uh, ask clinicians who have expertise and would be the ones who would be making these decisions, um, treating them as the gold standard. And we've developed a, an application to display uh, the images from secure storage and request scores from them. Uh, this is a screenshot of the logon page. Um, and uh, this would be restricted to people who have um, credentials to be rating these images and uh, 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 we'll, 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 we'll then be st saving these scores in a database with metadata about the scores. And we already have some um, initial scores uh, for our pilot image data to be getting on with. Um, the plan is to roll this out UK wide once we have access to the larger data sets. Um, the kind of things that we're asking for, um, the obvious one is, would you transplant this organ? Um, but we're also looking to gather some additional data, which will probably be organ specific. Um, an example is um, a metric of uh, steatosis, so how uh, fatty an organ is, um, which is something used often in um, evaluating livers, which is part of the pilot image data that we've got at the moment. It's quite a lot of liver and kidney data. So we're hoping to uh, gather a number of different characteristics about organs while still trying to keep it reasonably um, to, to, a, to a small small number of things that we're actually asking from clinicians uh, so that we can actually gather enough data from them. So the machine learning approaches that we're going to be taking with this, um, and we've been able to make a bit of a start with the pilot data, but of course, um, this is putting things in place for when we have uh, our main data set. Uh, we're splitting this a bit between our collaborators at Bradford and um, the team at Newcastle um, and taking a, a different approach in each case. So as um, partly to uh, hopefully increase our chances of success, but also make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes and we can um, bring these two approaches together at the end. So at Bradford, they're looking at speaking with clinicians and saying, what are the features that you guys are looking for when you're evaluating these organs and how can we extract uh, feature vectors that are um, capturing that? So an example in this uh, diagram is color. They're also looking at texture. Um, and looking at doing a lot of pre-processing and then applying um, regression models and uh, random forest approaches um, to have a more human understandable um, model for, which will hopefully still produce good, good results for predicting the expert scores. Um, whereas we're taking more of the uh, model-led feature extraction approach um, at Newcastle using these uh, larger convolutional neural networks pre-trained um, on um, things like ImageNet, so that you've got some initial feature extraction that can be done and then unfreezing the top layers and retraining uh, to be specific for the data that we have. Um, and the justification in this for this is in part that um, there, there may be features that clinicians uh, may not think of uh, to mention or may not be aware of that are making um, a difference to their evaluation. There may be things that these models can capture that we wouldn't be getting from our um, human-led approach. Um, but also some of the initial pilot work was done using this approach and had some success. So, uh, But the plan is that there's no reason why we can't use, um, if, if both work successfully, uh, use a combination of both in our final product. So some of the challenges I wanted to talk about as part of this um, were how we're going about accessing um, and storing these sensitive images. I've touched on this already. And as a consequence of this, um, creating a cloud infrastructure to interact with these sensitive images. 
and then uh, talk a bit about collaboration and communication across institutions, which is a problem faced by any um, large scale project. Um, so just some of the things that we've found helped in this case so far. So in terms of accessing and storing these sensitive images, um, as I've mentioned, we've got pilot data already for initial model development, and this large data set um, available from the blood and transplant clinic uh, needs to be stored securely, and the agreement we've got in place is to store this on the cloud. Um, we're using Oracle Cloud, who've generously provided credits for this project, um, and uh, we can store images then securely in control buckets, uh, which have a physical location in the UK and make sure that all of the other cloud infrastructure is located on the same physical servers. Um, and we can then put restrictions on both who has the ability to access these images, but also what they can access them for and do with them. So for example, one of the restrictions we've got is when we're not allowing these images to be downloaded, we need to interact with them on the cloud. Um, and metadata around these images is being secured in a is being stored in a MySQL database uh, with a Strapi instance interface to that to allow us to more easily interact with it. Um, so this has uh, led us to the issue of we needing to interact with these images in the cloud. So we need to create some cloud infrastructure to to do that because we have to access these images to actually train our machine learning algorithms. Um, so as well as setting access rules um, to allow our members who are involved in the machine learning and to, to use these images for the machine learning training um, and give them access to this database, uh, we've been using Oracle Cloud's data science provision, which um, includes virtual machines which are preloaded with Jupyter notebooks and Condor environments specialized for machine learning. Um, I, given the number of hands that were raised in the keynote earlier of people using Python, you're probably familiar with some of these things, but uh, if those are um, not familiar terms, um, Conda is, uh, Conda environments, uh, uh, it's an environment manager for Python, and Jupyter Notebooks provides a way of interacting with Python, which has integrated markdown comments, um, so it makes it uh, nice and human readable. Um, and one of the benefits of this is that some of our collaborators who we're needing to get onto the cloud to interact with the data uh, are unfamiliar with using the command line. So getting them to SSH into a virtual machine that we just set up um, to use Python from there on a Linux machine would be quite a learning curve for them. So instead we've been able to get them set up on these preloaded virtual machines where they've got a bit more of a graphical interface to interact with. And we've created templates for them to show them how to then go about um, running uh, Python functions we've written to query our database um, and retrieve the metadata and the images they need. Um, we're also able to deploy uh, trained models via cloud functions on Oracle, um, which is in order to fulfill the final um, aim of this project of having uh, an application where you can upload an image, um, send it via a post request uh, to an HTTP endpoint um, on Oracle Cloud, which will then pass the image to a machine learning model that's been pre-trained um, and give back its assessment as to whether or not we think this organ is viable for transplantation. Um, so we've got uh, this, these set up with um, placeholder models at the moment because they've only been trained on the pilot data, um, but we can have the infrastructure in place for this now, which here's a bit of a graphical overview of what that's looking like. So all these different moving parts are deployed on Oracle Cloud. We've got our notebook instance, which is our virtual machine um, running Jupyter notebooks. Um, and you can just run um, plain Python uh, scripts, um, functions and, and modules in that without needing to be wedded to Jupyter if you want to. Um, we've been using it mainly for partly making sure everything is well documented and partly for ease of use for our collaborators. And this includes uh, Strapi database queries um, to our database, which is hosted on the cloud, which will pull back a list of image IDs and scores. Um, we can then use that list of image IDs to request uh, images from um, our secure object storage and pull those images into the notebook instance, so still all hosted on the cloud. Um, and use those for uh, processing them um, as people see fit or splitting into test trained data sets and then training machine learning models. 
Um, we've then got functions as well, which will save the training results and model, model metadata back to the database um, so that we have a record over time of uh, what models have been tested and how well they've been performing and with the, what different data sets. And if we get, once we get to the point where we've got models that we're happy with, we can then deploy these um, as a cloud function that can be accessed via the front end application, which is also hosted as an Angular app in a container on the cloud. So this is our, our current solution for uh, interacting with these images, um, which so far uh, our collaborators have been on board with and seems to be running smoothly. Um, a few mentions on collaboration and communication across institutions um, as well. So as well as the use of the Jupyter Notebook instances, which have been a, a really handy way of getting people up um, on board as well as documenting what we're doing. Um, th this is a bit, this slide is a bit of a pitch for Git, which is again, probably preaching to the choir, I expect most of you are familiar with it. If not, it's version control software. Um, which has been um, really useful for us in this project. We've uh, even managed to get some of the clinicians looking at uh, tra tracking tasks and putting up some uh, tasks for us. And um, we've run some tutorials for some of our collaborators who are unfamiliar with it um, and set up Git repositories on the Jupyter Notebook instances so that if they want to work on some of their development offline, they can do so and then push it up and have it version controlled so that we're tracking uh, the the code over time as well, which given that the endpoint of this is potentially a, a medical application, we need to be making sure that we are uh, keeping track of um, the work that is done so we have um, records for regulatory purposes. Um, another thing I wanted to mention here that's a bit of a work in progress um, and would be great if people have any um, ideas about is establishing tests and standards for the models. So we want to make sure these models are actually working and doing what they should be if we're going to be using them to um, assess organs. So we've been trying to put in place some requirements for uh, tests that will mandate on models before they are uh, officially deployed. Um, and uh, part of that might would be um, pull request templates as well. Uh, to say, have you have you made sure that the model results are tracked in the database? And also things like, have you tested it using um, uh, randomized scrambled data inputs and made sure that that's not outperforming your um, actual data inputs, things like this. But this is something where I think there's still work to be done. So uh, yeah, hopefully that will be put in place and any ideas for good tests would be great. Um, so as a bit of a concluding remark, um, We've uh, found that we're able to use the cloud to work well, collaborating with the sensitive data and getting uh, everyone from different institutions on board working with the same data whilst keeping it securely stored in the same place. Um, Git has been a great tool for collaboration. Um, and the cloud hosted Jupyter Notebooks have been a useful tool as well from the machine learning side of this. Um, and yeah, this is an ongoing project. So thoughts or advice on how we can better go about achieving this goal would be really appreciated. Thank you for listening. Thank you. For the talk, Francis. No, um, oh, we're just sorry. going to do some questions, and then Francis is going to show um, a video afterwards, which the AV guy is going to sort out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, in the meantime, we have first question: um, How tied into Oracle Cloud is your infrastructure setup? Can it be easily shifted to another provider? And what, if anything, um, apart from free credits, made you decide to use Oracle Cloud? Oh, okay, good question. Um, so one of the things that we are that we have on our to-do list as a GitHub issue, um, and that I believe Oracle Cloud does provide is the ability to export Brand left. Oh, export um as a, a bit of a Terraform stack, um, everything that we have set up on the cloud. So there is a plan to do that, which should mean that we can then push it up to a different cloud provider. Um I'm not sure how smoothly that would go. I imagine that there might be some niggles to get it working. But yeah, so right now, everything we're running is on Oracle Cloud, but the it shouldn't be too hard in theory to set it up as a Terraform stack and push it up to a different cloud provider. I think one of the things we would need to sort out is um, because we're using the data science provision, which has these preloaded Conda environments and uh, Jupyter Notebook instances, it would involve then more manually setting up a virtual machine, which had all of the uh, necessary 
prerequisites for that, but that that would be a doable thing. Um, as to what what made us use Oracle Cloud other than free credits, um, the I mean, the free credits were certainly appealing because I think in previously main, mainly in our team we'd been using um, Azure and AWS. I'd certainly not used Oracle before. Um, I think having having used Oracle, it's it's been a useful tool, particularly for this, partly because of the data science provision. But the other thing is, um, it seems to be a bit more locked down from the start than some of the other cloud providers. By which I mean, um, when we create, say, the storage buckets, uh, the access is initially very limited, and you need to create permissions to do uh, to access at all. Which, given that we want to have these things very restricted, is actually a, a benefit. Um, yeah, if that answers the question. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so next one, do you have a versioning system for the database two? Oh, sorry, I skipped, sorry. Just gonna go to the top. Okay. Do you have different models slash nets for different organs or is it a single one for all? Um, it is different models for different organs. Yeah, at the moment, that's the approach we're taking is um, you would query the database for all livers, say, um, and train for that. Um, I. I would expect that that's likely to work better um, because there will be different characteristics of these organs, which is determining whether or not it will be transplantability, transplantable. Yeah. Um, okay, so now is the versioning one. <laughs> Do you have a versioning system for the database too, like you have for GitHub for sources? So there is, um, this is a question I feel like I'm not the best position to answer because I, I was... Uh, not the person who's been so involved in setting up the database. I know the database that we have that's um, an Oracle provided MySQL one does have uh, automated backups. So I think that's part of what is provided. Um, and I'm getting a nod from our Oracle man here in uh, in the Oracle database, my hosting of MySQL. Yeah. So we should be able to roll back from that using the uh, Oracle provided database provisioning, versioning, yeah. Good, backups are good. Right, um, next question. You mentioned that your models are currently trained using surgeon's assessment of the images. Are there other empirical measures of transplantability you could use to potentially give even better assessments than humans can? Potentially. Um, so one of the things, so while we don't have access to the full NHSBT, data set yet we have seen the spreadsheets and which includes the the headings of the metadata and one of the things that is available at least for some of the images that they have is um whether partly whether an organ was transplanted but also whether that transplant was successful which um yeah as you point out surgeons assessments um there will be times when a surgeon will say go ahead with transplant and that transplant will not be successful and not work well um so I think in some ways, potentially the best thing we could use would be the uh, actual outcome data from a transplant. Um, now, the downside of this is that we don't yet know how big that data set would be. And it would also only presumably include organs which have gone ahead for transplant. And it wouldn't be possible to know whether uh, an organ that wasn't put ahead for transplant would have been successful or not. Um, but we are very interested in um, trying to use that data as well as surgeon's assessment scores why not use both yeah so um would you like to show your video that you um if that's all right so let's hope it works yeah, and then we'll yes. wrap it so this is uh being kindly put together by um our uh, friends that were cool. so i'll just move this on top when surgeons are faced with the decision of is this organ suitable for transplant or not they have to make a decision there and then. And it's obviously really expensive and time consuming and resource intensive to send an organ to where it's needed. I'm working on this project called ORCA, which stands for Organ Quality Assessment. And we're building a tool to enable surgeons to uh, automatically assess the quality of organs for transplant. Oracle has brilliantly given us um, the support for the infrastructure that we need. This includes our database, our website, and all the tools we use for our machine learning models. 
this tool aims to support that very first decision making. So it doesn't replace the surgeons, but it gives a first initial indication of is this worth considering for transplant? It will enable more transplants to happen, saving more lives. And it will also save money for the NHS that you don't have wasted resources. Okay, thank you for letting us show that. Yeah, that was just a... Um, so there's some of my colleagues at Newcastle talking a bit more about the project and what we're hoping to achieve. Fantastic stuff. Thank you for concluding the AIML session and uh, let's put our hands together for Francis and our speakers.